It doesn't make sense. You know, my sister would not leave us for five and a half years and not say nothing. This, this whole thing of five years of Corbin constantly saying she's safe, she's in a safe home, but yet five and a half years later, he's still saying that, but now he can't find her. She was my sister. They feel like they took her away from me. We've spoken to several people in the past about the difficulty many experiencing domestic violence have escaping those situations. And we've also highlighted several cases where domestic violence is a major factor in missing persons and murder investigations. But I've never come across a case like the one we're reviewing today. In 2017, 36 year old mother of four, Amanda Doreen Dean, was in a bad relationship with an on-again, off-again boyfriend named Fred, and it seemed that she may have escaped that bad situation. At least, that's what her family thought. But on July 11th, when she stopped contacting them, they asked law enforcement to open a missing persons investigation, and they did, but they canceled it within 24 hours, telling the family that she wasn't actually missing, she was at a safe house. Now, five and a half years later, we're finding that that might not have been the case. And a new law enforcement team is trying to catch up on an investigation with a five and a half year head start on them from square one. It is definitely time to turn on the searchlight for Amanda Dean. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. Collins is a very small town in Huron County, located close to the northern tip of Ohio. It has a population of around 600 people and at only 4.6 square miles, it's the sort of town where most residents probably know each other. Somewhere in this small town is a property that might have the answers that the family of Amanda Dean has been looking for since her disappearance. Amanda's family, including her mother Carolyn, sister Shannon, and her adult son Joshua, held a press conference this week to try to reignite an investigation that never got the proper chance to start. Let's learn all we can about Amanda and the occurrences and circumstances around her disappearance. Carolyn Tokar, Amanda's mother, said that Amanda is her youngest daughter, a fun-loving and witty woman who has a smile that could light up any room and a golden singing voice. Amanda especially loves her four boys and is a true family person. Her sister, Shannon Dean, describes Amanda as someone who is cheerful and loves life, art, and music. Quote, she had a voice that was so beautiful when she would sing, we were just like in awe. She gets that from our dad. Shannon also wanted to make it clear that Amanda is not the type of person to go for a prolonged period of time without being in touch with her family. But here we are, looking at five and a half years of exactly that. Quote, I know she would not stay this long away from her family, because I know she's a very loving person with her family. She would not leave her family. This was not her character. She was my sister, and I feel like they took her away from me. Shannon seems to be referring to the on-again, off-again boyfriend, Fred. Carolyn says that Fred started getting violent with Amanda, including giving her black eyes and Amanda even being dragged around a room by a belt that was wrapped around her neck on a Christmas day. This happened in a cabin on property owned by Fred's family. Carolyn says these occurrences were reported to the sheriff, but as happens in many of these situations, Sometimes the victim doesn't want to press charges. In one instance, the sheriff's office saw enough that they could have pressed charges without her consent, but they chose not to. Amanda's sister also notes that Fred destroyed every phone that Amanda had, and Amanda would have to text her sister in secret using Fred's phone, then immediately delete the messages. Quote, she would let me know if she was okay and if she needed anything. There were times she would call me from his mother's phone. 
The last communication that Shannon had with Amanda was them planning her escape from Fred's home. They'd even lined up a place for Amanda to stay. Shannon was planning on helping Amanda move out on her next day off of work. But before that could happen, she received a message from Fred's mother. Shannon says the first message said, well, I went to the cabin and no Amanda. And as the messages continued further, they would say that Amanda was gone and that she and Fred were no good together. Shannon was concerned immediately that something tragic had happened. Amanda didn't have her own vehicle and typically didn't go anywhere. Plus, she was waiting for Shannon's day off to help get her out of there. When Carolyn heard about the messages that Fred's mother was sending, the family reported Amanda missing and also pulled together a search team of eight people to go looking around that cabin and the property it was on. They were met with no trespassing signs all over the property, warning that any violators would be shot. They heeded those warnings, but even though Carolyn asked the sheriff's office to search that property, as far as she knows, it still has never been searched. However, within an hour of the search effort that the family attempted, they got called into the sheriff's office with some news. The family was told by Todd Corbin that he had jumped through all sorts of hoops for them, but finally confirmed that Amanda Dean was located in a safe home. He said he was in contact with an advocacy agency for domestic violence that helped get her out of the situation. In an interview with Channel 3 in March of 2020, Sheriff Corbin would say, they explained to me the protocols they have in place is that we normally don't relay information, but for the purposes of what you're doing, we're just going to say that she's fine. She's in a good place. She's being cared for. It's at her discretion whether or not she wants to contact her family, he would say. Carolyn would reply, as a mother, you want to believe that, and I lived on that. She's going to come home. Carolyn would visit the sheriff's office regularly to check in and to try to pass along phone numbers and even Christmas cards to get to her daughter. He always led me to believe she was there, Carolyn would say, but the sheriff would never give her any additional details, including the name of the advocacy agency. Quote, no one has told us anything about where she was. We have nothing. All we have is words. And those words kept flying around. As the rumor mill kept spinning, the family was hearing a lot of different things. Some people were telling them that Fred's mother was saying that Amanda was in a mental hospital and that the family was just told it was actually a safe house. In January of 2018, someone from the prosecutor's office in Charleston, South Carolina, attempted to locate Amanda. She was scheduled to be a witness at the trial of another man who was accused of assaulting her, but they couldn't locate her. As time went on, Shannon was trying to reconcile several different stories she was hearing and felt like it all just wasn't making sense. She was also hearing that Fred's brother was getting very antsy about anyone being on the property that the cabin was on. Amanda's family hopes that property will eventually be searched, and with good reason. Her mother explains, I'm hoping they get whatever they need, search warrant, whatever, to go on the property, go to that cabin, but there's also something else. The day after her disappearance, there was an anonymous call to the sheriff's office. Deputy had a report on this that Fred had made threats to his friend that he was going to kill Amanda and stuff her in a blue barrel. Carolyn says that even though they have that report on record, she actually has a copy of the report herself, there was no follow-up ever done on that tip. She believes that there was actually no investigative work ever done on this case at all previously. And as of a few weeks ago, she even went back to the sheriff's office to file a new missing persons report. She was again denied, being told that she had to prove her daughter was in danger. My daughter's been missing five and a half years. That's danger enough to me, she told the deputy, who basically told her that that just wasn't good enough. Joshua Dean notes that, Amanda wasn't just a mother to him, but also a best friend, the type of mother he felt comfortable going to as a teenager with his problems, but he knew that she had some problems of her own. He would post on Facebook, the man she was with would constantly abuse her and treat her worse than anything I've ever seen. At the time, I couldn't do anything to help. I was too late to help. 
there is more we can do. Joshua Dean and his aunt Shannon started the Facebook group, Help Find Amanda Dean. You'll find a link to that group in the description box below. Please take a moment to check it out and show them some support. About his mother's case, Joshua says, it just hurts. I wish something would have been done sooner, but I'm grateful for what we got going on right now. Shannon says that the past five and a half years, Sheriff Corbin has basically stuck to his story. While I've never heard of a safe shelter that would house someone for five years, Channel 3 did reach out to several shelters in their area back in 2020, and they were told that while it's not usual, it's not completely unheard of for someone to stay at a safe house for a few years. In regards to the sheriff's story about the findings of his investigation, Shannon plainly states, it's hard when people have lied to you for so long. The family had to find some way to escalate this, and it seems they did. They wrote a demand letter to the sheriff's office demanding proof of life for Amanda Dean. Proof of life is typically something requested of kidnappers, unmistakable evidence that a hostage is alive. Sometimes a photo with a current newspaper or a video will be used to prove that the detained person is still alive. Carolyn told the press, I want Huron County to investigate this the proper way. I want them to do that. If they can't prove to me, if they can't prove to us that my daughter is alive, then they need to be reinvestigating this person, this property, and they need a full investigation. While the sheriff was still reporting to local news sources the same story that she was alive and being kept in an undisclosed location, the sheriff also wasn't really giving the reporters solid answers. He would write an email to the Ogden newspapers eventually in response to the family's demand letter saying, there is no answer the sheriff's office could provide that would satisfy the request of the family. The sheriff's office has made attempts to locate Amanda Dean, but those attempts have been futile because of the lack of information. I know that the Huron County Sheriff's Office has done everything in our authority to search for her whereabouts. We will look for an outside agency to continue the search. So was the sheriff telling the truth? Was the sheriff actually not telling the truth in this case? I don't know. It really boggles my mind to think about this possibility that the sheriff kind of had a perfect excuse that no one could ever check to see if he actually did his job when that initial missing persons report came in. He could just tell the family, hey, I was in contact with this organization and I need to protect her rights, their rights. I can't tell you who the organization is, but we found her and she's doing fine. On the flip side of that, if he did actually do the work, then couldn't he easily corroborate that with the media by saying, uh, you know what, I checked in with several. I mean, how would he know which safe house she was staying at? He would have had to have called several. Did he just get lucky and hit the first one? I mean, I think, at least in terms of, of kind of appeasing the media around this, it would have been simple enough for him to say, I contacted these other five places. You can verify that I reached out to them on this day. They could go ahead and clear that up. But quite honestly, based on what I saw from, obviously there's limited media around this case. The sheriff really, he engages the media in these kind of big bursts. And then there's other times the media is reaching out to him and he's just not answering. So it's really hard to understand. But if we have a sheriff that's not being honest about the steps in an investigation, I think the public should be made aware of that. I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening in this case. Uh, knowing that there might be another agency now becoming involved, I would like to think that they would get a hold of whatever records that department had, and maybe they can verify this. Maybe they can have some spokesperson come out and say, you know what? We actually verified what the sheriff said. He did talk to someone that said that. Who knows? Maybe that organization isn't around anymore. Or that person isn't available anymore to reconfirm that. There might be all kinds of reasons, but I think some reason needs to come out about this because from what I can see, I believe he's still the sheriff in that area. Finally, on December 21st of 2022, more than five years after Amanda Dean's disappearance, the investigation was officially reopened. A week later, it was announced that the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, or BCI, is now handling the case. 
The BCI is an arm of the Attorney General's office, essentially a state-level agency that provides numerous services to local law enforcement divisions, including crime lab analysis, criminal records keeping, and investigators. While they clearly have the tools and likely the experience for a case like this, they're five and a half years behind. And now they need to start this investigation from the very beginning. We did get our missing person report after all, Caroline would say to the press. The family met with BCI just this week, and they know that these investigators are new to the case, but they're confident that they won't have to wait another five and a half years for answers. The first steps are to submit and update case information in the National Crime Information Center, review the case file to determine next steps, and begin conducting any interviews, said Stephen Irwin, a spokesman for the Attorney General's office. Carolyn, Amanda's mother, says, I know it takes a lot of patience on our part because we want it now, but I think we've got a good team we're working with now. Let them do their job, but I hope they bring her home or bring us answers. With so little known about her disappearance, the theories are nearly endless. Of course, there's the obvious that Fred has something to do in this case and that they need to check that property out there and either rule it out as being where Amanda is or see if maybe there's some clues five and a half year, years later that can help them understand where she went to. It's a big question in my mind, like was Fred even spoken to? That's something that I haven't been able to find any information on at all. I don't know if he was spoken to at the time. Uh, would he have relayed that type of info? I, I doubt he would have known what company was helping her get out of that house. So I don't think the sheriff like called Fred and Fred said, oh, I know she's staying at this safe house, call them to verify it. it. There's no way in my mind that it goes that simply. But was he even contacted at all to start with? I have no idea. But then we've got this other wrinkle in terms of this case that we hear about from another state. She's due for a trial against another former abuser. We've got another risk factor there. What if she did escape? What if she did leave and get to a safe house and then left there and then something happened to her? Because we've got, we've got just kind of this spider web of potential issues. And of course, what may be the least likely might be actually what the family is hoping for the most, that maybe she really did find an escape and she did just want to leave and that she's alive out there somewhere. The family is also very clear that if BCI isn't the organization to bring them the answers that they're looking for, they're going to keep climbing up. They will not stop until they know where Amanda is. She needs to be home, says her sister Shannon. Thankfully, Amanda's family has also been embraced by the Cleveland Family Center for Missing Children and Adults, a nonprofit started by Sylvia Colon and Gina de Jesus, who was a victim of the Cleveland kidnappings. She was actually held captive for nearly a decade. This organization provides a safe place for families to come to for support and resources while searching for a missing loved one. It also provides training to law enforcement on how to interact with families of the missing, including handling cultural differences, and they provide coaching and guidance to the general public on how to work with and support families and friends of the missing. Seems like an amazing organization and an organization that's specializing in several areas where Amanda's family has been let down. While the family is clear that they want to see Amanda and hope she's okay, her sister is also considering the worst possible outcome, and she notes that she wants justice for Amanda. Her sister Shannon would say, Amanda, if you can hear me, I love you, and I know you would want to come home, and I hope, I have faith that you will come home. Joshua adds, I just want my mom home. It sucks. I just want to see her. It's been five and a half years now. Last time I saw her, I was still in high school. I'm 24 now. It's difficult. It really is. Amanda has also become a grandparent twice since her disappearance. A little boy and a little girl, as well as her four sons. They're all waiting for answers. They're all waiting for Amanda. Her mother says, I have some bad feelings, but I'm trying to stay optimistic. 
I love you, Amanda, and I hope you'll come home soon and meet the new additions to the family. We're waiting for you. Amanda Doreen Dean would now be 41 years old. She stands at five foot seven and weighed 134 pounds when she went missing. She has blonde hair and green eyes. There is no last known clothing description or other distinctive physical features noted with NamUs. The family and their new partners are clear that no tip is too small and they need help from the public to move this case forward. If you have friends in this area, please share this video with them. If you have any information about this case, please pick up the phone. Call the BCI at 855-BCI-OHIO. That's 855-224-6446. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, I have a link to resources and a video that we've put together in the description box down below. Since 2015, we've always run limited commercial ads for the benefits of the viewers and the families that we're trying to help. Obviously, we can't do that without support. I'd like to give a big thank you to new patron Casey Schaefer. If you'd like to help, please visit lordnarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Ann Peters recently did. We really appreciate your support on our mission to run as few ads as possible while we're helping as many cases as we can. Thank you, WKYC Channel 3, for releasing the full press conference with Amanda's family online. I'll have a link to that in the description box down below, along with all the other sources that we used for today's episode. Also, a big thank you to everyone that is now rallying around to support this family on this very challenging case. I'm hoping the efforts are enough to overcome the lost time in this investigation. Let's keep those eyes, ears, and hearts open and looking for Amanda Dean. I'll see you again here soon on the Lord Narch channel.